Hey everyone, welcome to Minerals, Rocks, and Fossil Talks. This new segment is where I will talk to you about various minerals that you can find on this planet. The first of these will be the most abundant mineral on Earth, which is feldspar. Sorry, I'm very distracted, my gecko's out. Okay, so what is a feldspar? So it is a group of rock forming tectosilicates, also known as frame silicates. Basically, framework minerals are just things that minerals that make up rocks, make up the majority of rocks. Oh, she's back out. Go. She doesn't come out every day usually. You can see a little hit poking out. Mm-hmm. Alright, so feldspars. Uh, they make up 60% of the exposed rocks on the surface in Earth's crust. They also are what make up our soils and clays. There are actually several types of feldspars. The most common being orthoclays or case bar. So these minerals here. Potassium feldspars. And then you have albite and anorthite, which make up our plagioclase, which are these white ones in this rock. Um, they're calcium and sodium based uh, feldspars. Alright, so how is it that there are so many kinds of feldspars? Why are there multiple kinds of feldspars? Why is it not just one, one thing? Well, feldspars crystallize in magmas. And depending on that magma's composition, um, different cations combine with aluminum and silica, which is SiO2, and they combine in different amounts. And that creates different types of feldspars. So let's look at a couple of diagrams. So the first thing you will notice is that Eric will be so kind as to put the compositional phase diagram for feldspars right here so that I can show it off. <clears throat> if you look up at the top, that is where orthoclase and microcline are case bar, potassium feldspar and the member goes. That is KAAL SI3O8. That is its chemical composition. It starts up at the top. If you look down the side, it'll say sanidine. <clears throat> and as you go from that end member, you'll go sanidine and orthoclase to albite. So albite, end member for our sodium plagioclase. So that'll be NAAL SI3. Oh, wait. And from albite, as we go across the bottom, you go oligoclase, andesine, labradorite, bitonite, and then anorthite. And anorthite is our other end member of the triangle. That is our calcium plagioclase. So that is CaAl2Si2O8. And then there's this big gap. On the triangle, that's our miscibility gap. So that is how we get our uh, different feldspars. That's what it looks like graphically. All right. And then on this side, we're gonna have our basically our magma composition chart, where it shows you how much feldspars make up. And as you look across, we go from felsic to intermediate to mafic to ultramafic. Don't worry too much about what those means. Just know that those are different compositions of your magma. And depending on the type of magma you have, tells you how much uh, feldspar you have in there. So our felsic and our intermediates are over 50% made up of feldspars. Um, and it varies on which kind of feldspars it is. It could be case bar, it could be plagioclase. And as you go closer to your mafic, less than 50% of your mafic rocks have felt, are made of feldspars. And then your ultra mafic, there's hardly any feldspars in there at all. <clears throat> and the feldspars are the parts of those rocks that tend to make them a little lighter colored. So, 
just to give you an idea, I have different types of uh, rocks here that have feldspars in them. So if we're looking at our intrusive rocks, rocks like this gratidiorite, all of the white that you see in there is plagioclase. So it makes up a vast majority of this gratidiorite. Whereas if you were to look at this andesite, there's not as much in there, it's, it's darker. Um, we have a few feldspars that kind of stick out. There's a lot of quartz in this and a lot of darker minerals. If we look at our extrusive rocks, we have things like rhyolite, which have a lot of feldspar in them. That's kind of what's making the lighter colors in here. Then you have things like basalts, which also have feldspars in them, but they're very few and far between and stuff like this. And I couldn't see anything on the surface when I was looking under my hand lens. So this is be one where if there are feldspars in this, you'd have to look under a microscope to be able to see that. You can also see the feldspars in metamorphic rocks, like this nice. All of that pink and white coloration you see in there, that's all feldspar. So these pinky white lines, that's feldspar. It's probably caspar at that color. We also use feldspars to tell us how mature a sandstone is. Now, sandstone maturity just refers to how much quartz there is in there and how far away it is from the source rock. The further away from the source rock, the more quartz there is. And that's just because quartz is really hard to uh, break down. Now feldspars are not. Chemically, feldspars are really easy to break down. That's why they make up the soils and the clays and the, a lot of our surface uh, detritus that we have. Now the closer we get to the source rock, for wherever a river is hauling its load from, the more feldspars you're gonna find into it, the, in it, the less mature it is. So if you're finding a sandstone that has a lot of feldspar in it, you're close to the source rock, it's not very mature. And for the most part, they're not gonna be well-rounded. If you look at the grains, they'll be very angular. Um, and the further away you get, the less you're gonna find feldspar in there, and the more it's just gonna be these nice, well-rounded, well-sorted, Quartz crystals. Uh, wish I had an example. Right now, all I have are mature sandstones. I don't have any immature ones. Don't know why. We're gonna have to fix that. Um, but that gives you an idea of some of the important reasons we use feldspars. Now, let's talk. Uh, let's talk about the physical properties of feldspars so that you can identify them. So, I showed you these earlier. We have case bar and plagioclase here. Now, case bar is often pink or orange. Sometimes it can be white, but usually it's kind of a pink or orange color just from the potassium. Whereas plagioclase is usually white to kind of a grayish color. You can get others like labradorite, which are like blue and green, um, and you can get yellows and reds and even colorless but those are not as common as your pinks, oranges, and whites, and grays. Uh, you can do a streak test, so, hang on one moment. One minute, 37 seconds later. All right, so a streak test is just taking a rock on something like a blackboard here and scratching across. Your feldspars are going to leave a white streak. I don't know if you can see that, but, it does leave us a, a white streak on this. They both will. So I take this one. Also leaves a nice white streak. Another physical uh, property that we can use is luster. That's basically the shine that you get off of it. So our feldspars tend to have a vitreous luster. Vitreous just means it's kind of glassy. Um, this rock's a little dirty, so it's not quite as obvious, but if you were to get it nice and clean, it would have a vitreous luster. Um, plagioclase can often have a sort of pearly luster to it, especially on, not especially, it will have the pearly luster on its cleavage planes where it has its striations, because this one has striations and plagio, or, uh, case bar does not. 
Um, Moe's hardness scale is always a good one. Feldspars have a hardness between six and 6.5. So they're pretty hard. Um, you can't scratch them with your nail. You can't scratch them with a knife, but you can scratch them with quartz. scratch. I don't know if it'll be obvious on there, but I did scratch it with the quartzite. Um, so that's one way to do that. Uh, cleavage is another thing, but that's usually more seen in thin section. These are river rounded, so you're not going to be able to see good cleavage planes on them, but they do have one perfect and one good uh, cleavage plane, and they intersect at 90 degrees. Fracture is another good physical characteristic. The fracturing occurs on the cleavage planes and they're uneven to conchoidal. You can look those definitions up. We have crystal habits, which we can show you the various ones right here. So orthoclase like this has an anhedral or euhedral crystal habit. Um, they're commonly elongate or tabular, which you can see in this elongate and tabular makes a nice little square and then your albite is commonly tabular um, has divergent aggregates granular cleavable massive this one's massive this one's also river rounded, rounded so it's good for looking at not necessarily for a lot of the, the crystal structure um, unless I break it and then anorthite is anhedral to subhedral um, and granular um, other identifying features, especially under a microscope, feldspars like to twin. So that means that they'll basically have two pieces that kind of stick out from each other. They twin a lot. Um, and it looks really cool under the microscope. Maybe, maybe Eric can find you a nice little microscope picture here. And just to end this fun video, we have some fun facts. Uh, so. As we mentioned, they crystallize from magma, they weather into clay minerals, they're used in glass making, ceramics, and sometimes a filler in paint, plastic, and rubber. So we find use for them. In archaeology, it's used for potassium argon dating, um, argon argon dating, and luminescence dating. I'm not an archaeologist, so I'm not entirely sure what that last one is, but hey, okay. Um, a rock with with a high feldspar content was analyzed on Mars by Curiosity. So we know that Mars has feldspars, super cool. Um, and feldspar has several types of uh, gemstones. Those gemstones include moonstone, orthoclase, amazonite, andesine, labradorite, labrador labradorite, and sunstone. So lots of fun uses for feldspars. Hope you guys learned a lot today and uh, fossilize you later. Okay, smart monoclinic steps on hard your skill. You really like your twins and you make up play shells. Oh, touch the tricline.